Well, good evening, everybody. How we doing tonight? <laughs> amen, amen. Well, it's an honor to be back with you guys and from Thursday night uh, and then here again. And I just want to kind of continue or really finalize, put an exclamation point on the encounter week on your 10-year anniversary as a church. And so if you're down, I'd love it if we just encounter Jesus together one more time. You good with that? Good. Amen. <clears throat> so um, my, my kids, I, they're with me this week, and I love them. They're also being very annoying. And uh, <laughs> because they have not, like, caught up like, with the jet lag. And so they keep getting up at 4.30 in the morning. And so I'm like, I love you, but like for the love, please go back to sleep, you know? First day we were here, we were at uh, someone's house, one of our pastor friends visiting them and they had a pool and my son was like, I'm going in the pool. I said, you can't go in the pool. It's freezing. And he's like, well, it's a pool. We don't have one. I'm going in. He's six. So he totally cold plunges and expects the rest of us to do the same. Okay, next day, next morning, 4.30 in the morning and he's at the edge of my bed going, dad, get up, let's go in the pool. I'm like, brother, it is not time for that. And you're gonna just sit there and watch me sleep until I wake up, you know, and just be patiently waiting. And so like, I could not go in. So at like noon, I'm like, okay, it is now time for me to watch you go in the pool, you know? <laughs> I said, now is the time. And uh, we, we've had a great time, but there is a spiritual parallel to that. And I just want to preach prophetically into that statement tonight. I really believe with all my heart, having witnessed what has taken place in this church, not just over the last several years, but over the last few days, that I believe God is pouring out his spirit on this church for a time just like this. I believe that God, and I said this Thursday, I believe God is raising this church up to be a great church in our nation, an influential church. Now is the time for that to take place. I believe that there is a deep calling to deep revival coming forth from the ground in our nation where people you never thought would come to Jesus are going to come to Christ. I think when you observe the world and how awful it feels like it is when you watch the news, probably should limit that. But when you watch it, it's like, good Lord, it, it feels like Things are falling apart and maybe, just maybe, that's exactly what needs to happen. I believe now is the time for a move of God unlike anything we've ever seen. I am hoping for that. I am believing for that. I am praying for that. And I believe we're about to walk into it in Jesus' name. So I want to preach a message tonight titled, Now is the Time. Now is the time. Look at somebody next to you and tell them, now's the time. Now's the time. Now's the time. Now, I know that you are studying as a church 1 Corinthians, okay? So I wanted to stay in that same vein, studying Corinthians, but I'm actually going to take us to 2 Corinthians. So a little, little bit of cheating, getting ahead here, all right? But we're going to stay in the same vein, 2 Corinthians. And I think, I think it's really going to speak to you tonight. We're going to start 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Are you ready? If you are, say yes. Okay, all right, 430, ready. But thank God, he has made us his captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. All right, let's stop there for a second. Look at me. I'm going to do a little Bible study tonight, a little preach, teach, okay? A couple of things I, I want to I just bring your attention to. First and foremost, Paul says, thank God. He says that a lot, probably something we should do a lot. Just thank you, Lord. But he also says he, he makes us his captives, and he doesn't expound on this a lot here, but really it is him kind of repeating himself and setting himself up to say it later, that my whole life I'm in chains for Christ, and I'm glad about it. Whatever Jesus wants, I'm good with it. In fact, I've had the world, and it's all rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. That's, that's kind of what he's saying. And also, I just want to say in that same vein, like there's nothing like having Jesus. You know, a lot of people, sometimes when they're disgruntled with the church, will be like, oh, we just need to get back to the early church. You ever heard somebody say that? 
And like, yeah, there's some value to like things that the early church did. And I think that's really important. But also if you consider the early church, these people, okay, that he's writing to this church in Corinth, they are the early church and they are crazy. They got a lot of issues. Just wait, just wait till next week. Or as you keep studying first Corinthians, it's like, wow, these people are, I feel a little bit better about myself. Amen. You know, and then not just that, like when you consider the logistical challenges of the early church, you've got a building, you've got air conditioning, heat, you got nice seats, you got, you know, great looking guest speakers, you know, who knows if they had that, okay? <laughs> and then, and then like, not only they got the drama, they got logistical issues. Um, you know, I, I, I think too, like, uh, it, it was just, it was just hard People were chasing them, ready to kill them, basically. Just keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Not only that, uh, these people met pretty much every single day. Now, I know we had Encounter Week meeting every single day, okay? But like, okay, are you tired? (laughs) I mean, they just met every single day. And they gave way more than 10%. You down for that? Double tithe, reverse tithe, you know? So, so when we're saying early church, please understand, like, like these people, they had a lot going on here. I think again, Paul going, I'm a captive to Christ. Like he's got all of me. And at the end of the day, I want Jesus and I want to build his kingdom. And that's what matters most. That's just really what he means when he's saying I'm, I'm a captive. Now that doesn't have a ton to do w- w- with where we're going, but it is, it is a setup. Here we go. Verse 15. Okay. Excuse me. Let me keep reading. Now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. Verse 15. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God, but this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. Now, we'll get to that last statement in a moment, but but let me set us up here. Paul takes an image, as he's writing this, from an ancient Roman triumphant procession. This would be like a sight you've never seen before in your life. It would be like a Disney parade on steroids. I mean, all the fanfare when the generals would lead the procession and there would be all this kind of dress up and fireworks and trumpets and music and food and celebration and, and drums and all these different things. And they would have people cheering and there would be these sweet perfumes from the Roman world that you would smell. You would see the prisoners of war and those who were gonna be executed. I mean, it was a sight to behold. You'd see the spoils from war. And what Paul is saying here is basically he's going, hey, like like we, God leads us in this triumphant procession and our lives are like a sweet perfume within the procession. Paul actually sees himself and sees this church as those who are a part of this procession. He sees Jesus as the general of the Lord's army who is victorious. And he sees himself and he's trying to encourage the other believers to also get a line and pick up arms and go, hey, now's the time to fight. Now's the time to build. Now's the time to witness. Now's the time to start churches. Now's the time to understand your place in your journey of life. Your place is to march with Jesus. He's the winner. He's never going to lose. And if you walk with him, you're going to win too. And that's what Paul's saying. And I love that. I love that because that's exactly the way I see it. I see it for this church. I see for this church, us marching through this community, more locations, revival in our streets, buildings, more baptisms, Jesus revered among this city, among your neighbors in this region, in our nation, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit unlike anything we've ever seen. Like you've got to see it like that. Some of you have to stop seeing yourself as a prisoner of war. Someone who's just hunched over like, "Mm, another day, life's horrible. My name's Eeyore. (laughs) God loves me, I think. And Paul's like, guys, your life 
is a sweet perfume. You are a winner. You are a champion in Jesus. Pick up arms. Now's the time we win in the end. So now he goes to this fragrance. I really, I really want to I really want to expound on this. He goes to this fragrance. And what the fragrance is, is he says it like this. He says a knowledge, but it's kind of like an awareness. Uh, more than that, the fragrance represents worship. Worship. And I don't just mean like, like worship, like us singing a song or two that we just sang. Because, man, we're really good at singing songs in the church of Jesus Christ today. You know, we sing, you are a healer then, doesn't it heal me now? I don't know. You are the same God. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I, I, whenever I sing these songs, there's so many of them, I just make stuff up. I like crossover songs. I'm just like, I don't know what I'm saying anymore. But you know what? Like Christians, honestly, we, sometimes like, we're just kind of big time liars. Like, do you really believe it? You know, I'm calling on the God of David. You know, I know, we do got Goliaths, but you believe that you are in this triumphant procession ready to knock him out in Jesus' name? You know, and I, and I fear this. I fear that we have a Saul generation, a King Saul generation, you know, where Saul needed David to come in and play some music so he could be soothed and get some relief from his anxiety and his demonic oppression. And I fear very much, I get concerned very much that we have a generation that is very good at singing these songs and loves to sing in the form of worship, but does not live a lifestyle of a worshiper. That we come in here and we get soothed momentarily, but then we go out there and we are in the same sin and the same depression and oppression and anxiety and fear and anxiety, all this different stuff. And so we are soothed for a moment in the presence of God, but we walk out and we are not victorious out there. And what I believe this moment is calling for in your victory is I believe that it is now time for us to be worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. It is now time to worship in spirit and in truth. So what does that mean, right? So Paul's like, hey, you've got this fragrance that goes up, this awareness, it goes up to God. When you are living a life of holiness and of righteousness and of purity and of character, when you are living a lifestyle in pursuit of the Lord, not just on Sundays, because Sundays are great and important, and I commend you for being here, and it's a part of it. But when Jesus is the center of your life, and you are a captive to Christ every day of the week, what you have moved from is worshiping to being a worshiper. From just singing songs to living a life song, if you will. And that is when our fragrance, that is when our life gets up to the Lord and it is a sweet aroma. When, when our whole life is consumed by God, what happens is, is it becomes a vertical fragrance and a horizontal fragrance. Other people in your life then get impacted by how you smell, if you will. See, your lifestyle, it goes up to heaven and it goes out to earth. You know, there is no sense like smell. You notice that, like I'll, I'll never get over dirty diaper seasons, okay? Probably about six months away from that ending, but I'll always remember it. You know, you take your kid to like a basketball game and all of a sudden you're sitting there and you get a whiff of the court and you find yourself in ninth grade again, stressed out about dream time. You know, or maybe you, you, you smell flowers, you're at the beach and it takes you to your wedding and you sense this nostalgia. There's something powerful about scent. And, and, and when it comes to fragrance and scent, the believer, our whole fragrance does not consist so much in what we do, but in our manner of doing it. Not so much in our words or in our deeds, but as in an indefinable sweetness and tenderness and courtesy and unselfishness, a vibrant spiritual life that you can breathe in and sense something is different about you. 
This fragrance is attractive to God and to people who don't know him. So if you want to live a lifestyle, which I believe it is now time for us to be worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth, you're going to ask yourself these questions. Is my life attractive to others? Is my relationship with God so vibrant that it is intriguing to other people, both believers and non-believers? Is my love inviting to others? Is my home peaceful for others? Are my principles unwavering? Is my hope inspiring? I think it's very worthy of us to examine ourselves and ask these questions. In a sense, what does my life smell like? What am I giving off? Is my Monday worship to God? Is my Monday evangelism to others? Is my Monday discipleship to others? Uh, Paul is not expecting, Jesus is not expecting you to walk out your faith and never make a mistake, no. You're in a perfecting process. You are being transformed. You are being renewed. You are being changed. But if you're, if there's no transformation, if you're the same when you said yes to Jesus, and you're the same after you said yes to Jesus, then you stink. And I don't mean B.O. I mean, there needs to be a come to Jesus because now is the time to be a worshiper in spirit and in truth. Jesus changes things. Now, on the contrary to this, a little bit on the contrary, it fits, but it seems like it. If we go to verse 16, and it's a little bit at the end of verse 15, but it says, to those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. Paul's dramatic, isn't he? But to those who are being saved, we might call them people of peace. We are a life-giving perfume. And who is adequate for such a task as this? Now, I want to stop there for a second. Look at me for a moment. I love that Paul writes this because remember, Paul was angry and a murderer before Christ. And then he goes on and he writes, and you'll get to it later, 1 Corinthians 13, he defines what love is for us right? He, he, he was zealous. He had knowledge, but he didn't have spirit, right? I mean, he was, he was messed up. You would say he was inadequate. Pre-Christ, no one would think Paul could do this, but Jesus changes everything. And it's encouraging to us because you have to remember something, guys. This stuff is not written to us, but it's written for us. All right, understand that. Not written to, but written for, which means if he is presenting to these crazy people in the church of Corinth, God bless, we love you guys, if you're listening, okay? If he's saying that, and if he's saying that about himself, who is adequate, then he's also saying that to you. Maybe you got in a fight on your way here with your spouse. Maybe you got some stuff you're dealing with. Maybe you feel like you're unworthy. Maybe you don't know how to lift your hands and you're new in Christ. Maybe you want to reach somebody, but you don't know how. Maybe you've got a hang up or a struggle. You feel inadequate. The good news is if Paul could be adequate, so can you. It's the age old adage that God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And if you're sitting here tonight, God will qualify you if you just say, yes, Lord, make my life a fragrance. Now, I guess I should keep reading. Here we go. Verse 17, you see, man, I feel like preaching tonight. <laughs> I, get a, I read a, like a word and I'm like, let's go there. Okay, you see, verse 17, we are not like the many, this is great. We are not like the many hucksters. What a word. You haven't heard that one in a while. This is NLT. Who preach for personal profit. We preach the word of God with sincerity and with Christ's authority, knowing that God is watching us. So, okay, we're going to get to hucksters in a minute. But what basically what, what Paul is saying is like, hey, when you live a lifestyle of worship, when, when you give off a, a holy fragrance to the Lord, and that fragrance then goes out to other people, not everybody's going to like you. There's going to be people in your life who you're praying for, who you are witnessing to, where they, uh, they might be people of peace, where they're like, they're open to the gospel. And your sense, 
Your fragrance, man, that's meaningful to them. Don't mess that up. Okay, but there's going to be other people who are anti-God and anti-Christ. And no matter what you do, even if you are loving and giving and caring, they're still going to hate you and have disdain towards you. Now, I want to encourage us to, as we deal with those who are not believers, and if you are not a believer or not yet a believer and you're here tonight, let me just say, as believers, we're not supposed to act like jerks or hucksters. Okay, don't ruin your witness and don't perpetuate a narrative about Christianity and God that shouldn't exist. Okay, so please, don't be a moron. So here, okay. But, but I'm just saying, like, you also can't get caught up when somebody is like, nah, I'm not with you because you're with God. Have you ever been in a worship environment? Maybe this was you at once. But the presence of God comes and all of a sudden people get squirmy. It's like the spirit of going potty hits the room. It's like you sit at your desk for eight to 10 hours a day. You never move. You drink coffee all day long. But you get into church, you're here for 30 minutes, and you got to go to the bathroom four times. You know what I'm talking about? You, you know what that is, right? It's more spiritual than you think. Because, it, because sometimes when the spirit of God, when God's trying to do something and then the presence of God, sometimes people just get uncomfortable, like, I got to get out of here. And sometimes when you're in sin, even you're like, oh, I'm feeling uncomfortable. Or maybe God is speaking to your heart and all of a sudden you got to go potty. And so I just, I'm telling you, the presence of God, it, 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 it changes everything. It invites, it heals, it speaks, it's powerful. But it also brings forth a confrontation. It absolutely does. And not everybody wants or likes the presence of God. I want to teach you, Christian, how to interact with the world because a lot of believers in the hope of being accepted by non-believers will compromise on convictions or bend the Bible to accept what isn't acceptable or act a certain way in church, but then another way in the world. And sometimes people, they love somebody, but that person is in sin. And so they will try to bend the body to make the, the Bible to make themselves feel better in that person and you're not doing them a service. And so can I just tell you, Christian, how you're supposed to interact with the world so you never question this ever again? You must relentlessly love those who don't know Jesus while at the same time remaining uncompromising in your convictions and belief in the word of God. Love, 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 love. But you stop loving when you start bending. Man, that's a good word. You, everybody's, oh yes, pastor, that's good. You, you do, you stop loving when you start bending the word of God to be something it isn't. We cannot be concerned, friends, listen to me, we cannot be concerned with society, friends, family, or employment rejecting us and discriminating against us on account of our faith in Jesus Christ. We must never bow to godlessness. We must stand out for Jesus always like a fragrance. Paul uses that word huckster. In some translations, peddler. And actually what it is, is it was a winemaker who would put way more water in it to drown out the wine and elevate their profits. Well, what are they doing? They're cheating. They're diluting the power of the product. And when you bend on the word of God, when you don't stand firm in your convictions, what you are doing is you are diluting the fragrance that gets to the Lord and you are diluting your fragrance that gets to the world. You want to worship in spirit and in truth? Well, I believe now is the time. Man, stand on the word of God, believe in it, love it, and let the Lord take your heart captive. Now is the time to do so. All right, let's, let's jump to 2 Corinthians 3, okay? Let's continue in our Bible study. Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. Somebody say bold. bold. We're not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away, but the people's minds were hardened. And to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. 
And in other words, particularly those of the Jewish faith might hear the old covenant and not see Jesus in it, even though he's right there. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil and they do not understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. What, what's happening here, what, what you see here is uh, the initial giving of the old covenant. It's Moses on Mount Sinai and there's thunder and lightning and trumpets and glory. And Moses has this encounter with God where he has so impacted that his face is glowing so much that for him to interact with the people, he actually had to put a veil over his face. And the thing about the Old Testament and what Paul's illuminating here to this church is, hey, that was the old way. There's a new way. The old way was only for some, but the new way can be for everyone. And what I love about this is Paul's going, hey, guys, like when I say to be bold, when I'm telling you now's the time to be bold, it means the new covenant exists and you get to boldly approach Jesus. You get to have the same spirit that was outside of Moses. You can have that same spirit within you living through you now. That's actually great news because the old covenant was impossible to keep and it would fade away. The new covenant also impossible to keep because it's grace and it's a higher standard. But you get Jesus. Jesus gives you his spirit. The same power that conquered the grave now lives in you, which means even if it's impossible, everything's possible with God and you can live a life worthy of your calling because of the Holy Spirit. This is why I'm saying it's not just time for us to be worshipers in spirit and in truth, but time for us to be bold. Bold. You get all of Jesus. You might as well go get all of his spirit. I want to illustrate something because I think it's really important for us to be bold in our prayers, in our evangelism, in our discipleship. So I want to invite a couple of people to help me for a second, because I, th I think this, this, this illustration will help you, okay? So I've got some Lego pieces, okay? Because how could I have children and not use Legos as an illustration? And I, I think I have two people that are going to help me. I have Pastor Eric, who pastors over in Glendale, by the way. Great, great church, the Bridge Church. He's here. He's going to help me. He's one of my good friends, so he's just here tonight. So anyway. If you're ever over there going to a football game, make sure you go to Eric's church that day. Okay, here we go. All right, come on over, guys. All right, so what's your name, my friend? Steven. All right, Steven. Powerful name. Okay, Steven, you're not. Okay, so I'm going to have you put this on, okay? Cover your eyes totally. All right, and stand right back here. Now, let's say Steven, and we're going to get to Eric in a second. Let's say Steven is not a believer, Okay, he's not a believer. All right, so Stephen, I want you to take the yellow brick and I want you to put the yellow brick on the red brick. Go. Don't help him yet. Just pray for him. Okay, okay, okay. Terrible job. God bless you. Okay, <laughs> okay, so hold on. Hold on. I, 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 we're gonna get to you guys. Okay, so Stephen, okay, what if Stephen meant well? Maybe he did. Maybe he's just, he's trying to do well but he's got a veil over his eyes. He doesn't know Jesus. And we know we can do no good apart from Jesus. So even if he means well, he can't do good because he has a veil over his eyes. Okay, Stephen, go back, go back, go back, feel your way to the Legos. You got it, you got it, God bless you. Okay, now let's say Eric, Eric loves Stephen. He's his friend, he's his coworker. And so Eric, why don't you stretch your hands out to Steve? Don't touch him yet though. Can't touch him yet, all right. And let's just pray for Stephen's salvation, okay? Now, now, Eric is bold in his prayers. He boldly approaches the throne room of grace, believing that Stephen is going to come to Jesus. And Eric is living a life where he's not a jerk, okay? Uh, and his fragrance is going out, and Stephen is a person of peace, and he's compelled. And all of a sudden, Stephen recognizes and realizes, I'm making a mess of my life, and I need Jesus. And so Jesus takes the veil off Stephen's eyes because the prayer of the righteous availeth much, and Stephen is now in the fold of Christianity. Okay, sorry, Stephen, I messed up your hair. Okay, his hair's messed up, but he's going to heaven. Hallelujah. Okay, okay, right? So 
So Eric, thank you for praying. Don't take credit for Jesus. Okay, well, thank you for praying, Eric. Okay. Now, what happens when you first get saved? Everybody following so far? Right? That's, that's, that's the, the picture of the veil, right? Now, now, now what happens, take, remove this, okay? Take everything off, Stephen, okay? What happens sometimes when you give your life to Jesus, okay, is all of a sudden your life just doesn't get perfect. We say like this in our church, it might not get easier, but it will get better, okay? Because actually... It, it gets messed up because it's like, man, Stephen was, was living with his girlfriend. Stephen had all this kind of stuff. I don't know, all these different things. And it's like, well, now I got to go deal with my life that was messy. It's going to get a little messier before it gets better. You know what I'm talking about? So what happens though, okay, Stephen, I want you to put this back on. Okay, I want you to put this back on. Okay, there's veils. You ain't going to, to heaven. But then in the life of the believer, there's blind spots. And a lot of us might have some of these. And, you know, uh, Pete Scuzzero, pastor in New York City for a long time, he said that you can be free in your spirit, but bound in your bones. There could be generational iniquities. There could be challenges, things that he doesn't see. So, so Eric is his good friend. Now Eric has brought him to Christ, but Eric is going to start discipling him. And because he has blind spots now, okay, now Stephen, again, put blue on yellow. No, not yet. I'm just, this is, this is your life without a disciple, uh, discipler. Okay. Blue. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So right now, would you say that Stephen really wants to do things the right way now, especially in Jesus, but he's still got blind spots. So it's hard for him, even if he means well, can't do it. So now, now he's got Eric, not only praying for him, but discipling and helping him. So Eric, why don't you help Stephen put yellow on blue, take his hand, come on, help him do it. Yellow on blue, right? Right. You got it. You got it. You can do it together. Right. And then, and then the more he does it right, right. After a while, the, the, the blind spots begin to come off. All right. Take these off one more time. Right. And it gets to a point where now Stephen can even do some of these things. He can put red on yellow and now my man's doing it on his own, you know? And it's like, come on somebody, Eric, way to be a disciple maker. Thank you guys. Great job. Do, do you understand why it's important for us to be bold? Be bold. Thank you, guys. Because you know what the Bible says about boldness? Check this out. Hebrews says, approach God confidently and boldly. Ephesians says to pray with frankness, which is total honesty and confidence. Jesus declares our Father and invites us to do the same. David shouts his prayers in trouble and triumph. Paul says, pray at all times and without ceasing, all types of requests and petitions. In other words, these great people of the faith are telling us to be bold. Pray for lost people. Pray for people to come to Jesus. Pray for your spouse's blind spots to be removed. Pray for your own blind spots to be removed. Pray that, that, that someone who needs to come to Christ will come. Pray in your own life. You, there is no limit to what you can pray, but you got to pray boldly and in faith. And that is what Paul is inviting us to do. This is the hour for boldness. Now is the time. Okay. I got five minutes left. Ish. No, I do. I do. I do. I do. Verse 17. We're going to close with this. Okay. So I'm believing now is the time. Great revival is coming. More buildings, more locations more people, more baptisms, your friends, your prodigals coming home. How many of you just believe for your kids who've run from Jesus going to come home? I'm believing that for you. Okay. Okay. Lifestyle of worship and truth, a lifestyle of boldness, bold prayers, bold evangelism. But, but, but watch this verse 17 for the Lord is the spirit and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. You see that discipleship process playing out. I believe that now is the time for us, for believers, for Christians, to get free to pursue freedom, freedom from the same stuff 
same sin patterns, same issues. It's time to break through the glass ceiling. I'm just believing for you in your business. I'm believing for you in your home, in your workplace, in your career, in your marriage, with your kids. I'm believing for a total break the glass year and a freedom unlike anything you've ever experienced. And the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now, what is Paul talking about? Paul is really, he's illuminating when we hear that word liberty or freedom. I, I would just say sometimes in the church, in the Christian church, particularly in charismatic churches, Pentecostal backgrounds, Sometimes we take liberties for granted or we take liberties way out of its meaning. And so I just want to be clear, like, we don't ever have the liberty to disobey the word of God. We don't ever have the liberty to say God is saying something that he isn't or vice versa. You can't just get up and prophesy. That's called manipulation. It's demonic, actually. You, you, you don't have the liberty to have disorder or chaos in a church gathering, particularly go against authority. You don't have the liberty to go against God's creative design, his laws of nature, sexuality. You don't have liberty to go against yours or others' personal convictions where there's gray areas in Scripture. Got to be careful of that. But what, what is Paul really getting at? Paul, when he says freedom, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. What he means is, is access. That's what he's talking about. That you and I, you and I, where the Spirit of the Lord is, we have access to the Lord. We have access to freedom. In other words, you are marching in a triumphant procession with Jesus and you are not the prisoner of war. You have access to the guy in charge and to the guy who's winning the victory. You do not have to stay hunched over. You actually get to pick up your shoulders and say, not only am I free, I am victorious. I'm the righteousness of Christ. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going out. Right? I mean, you just go on and on and on. That is what I have in Jesus. You have access. I don't know if you've ever met somebody like totally free in the Lord. There's a fragrance about them that's appealing, that's inspiring. Like I've met a few of those people in my life. I, I hope to be one of those people that is just so vibrant in my journey with the Lord. I want to be like them. Here's who they are. They're, they're people with problems, but they're confident. They're, 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 they're imperfect, but they rarely sin. They need miracles and they get them. Uh, you could go on and on and on. Like, have you ever met somebody just, man, they're free. And I want to just honestly, I want to pastor you for a second. I know I come in as this, you know, occasionally as this crazy person from Philadelphia who tells you stories about how people try to kill me and stuff. And, and that happens and it's awesome. But can I just be on the pastoral staff for a minute? Can I? I want to help you. You should take screenshots of this. You, you should write this down. Do you want to be free? Here's how to be free. Firstly, you must believe in Jesus as the Son of God. If we don't start there, we can go nowhere. Number two, you have to acknowledge any wrongdoing or potential wrong thinking because there's no healing without honesty. We must bring to the light what has been hidden in the dark. Number three, you got to repent of your sin with intention to walk away. I love the way Pastor Kyle explained repentance during communion time. Repentance is not taking advantage of or swiping the credit card of grace where you're like, Lord, forgive me. You says in your word, that if I confess with my mouth, believe in my heart, I'll be saved. 
that you're faithful and just to forgive me of my sins, cleanse my own righteousness. You know, thank you, forgive me, Lord. And then like, but I plan also to like go do the same thing I'm gonna do after service. That's not repentance. That's a dark heart. What repentance is, is you going, okay, I, Lord, I give this to you, Lord, and I have intention to turn from it. The righteous fall a few times, but they get back up. Their intention is, I'm following you, Jesus. I'm walking away from this lifestyle. I'm walking away from this sin. I don't plan to go back. Number four, you must invite an encounter with the Holy Spirit. That can be a moment. It can be an ongoing pursuit. But the Holy Spirit will bring insight to you. Lastly, you got to live a life of ongoing prayer. Because prayer leads to ongoing transformation. And freedom for some happens immediately. And for others, it's a process. And if you stop talking to God, you'll stop getting free. And so tonight, as we close this gathering, as we finish Encounter Week, as, as we close the chapter on a 10-year celebration, I'm down if you are to invite the Holy Spirit here to do some work, to help some people get free. I want us to walk out of here knowing now's the time for me to worship in spirit and in truth. Now's the time for me to pray and live a bold life. Why? Because now's the time I'm walking out of here free because who the sun sets free is free indeed. Come on, you believe that tonight? And if you missed any end of this, you know, they, they always put this stuff up on, on YouTube and stuff. So just circle back. But I, I, I want to have you stand to your feet, okay? Everybody in this room. <sighs> Nowhere for us to be. Cardinals didn't make the playoffs. Eagles didn't make the playoffs. There's, there's just, there's no, there's no, there's no hope for us with football, okay? <laughs> well, I might as well get free. We're going to sing a song in a second, but I actually, I just want you to close your eyes right where you're at and, if you're just saying, man, I need to get free in some areas of my life. I, I, I wasn't, maybe you weren't here Thursday to experience some, some, some breakthrough altar time, but you're saying, man, I need some freedom in, in my life and my marriage and my fine. I need some freedom. Would you just, would you just, like you're receiving a gift, will you hold your hands out? You're saying, I need some freedom. And I believe the Holy Spirit is here. And I believe the Holy Spirit is highlighting some areas in your life, almost like a, like a highlighter, just, hey, you need to deal with this when you, when you leave here. You need to deal with that person that you're talking to who is not your spouse. That's for somebody tonight. You need to, you need to cut that relationship off. That's limiting your freedom. There's people here tonight, you're refusing to be generous and trust the Lord with your resources and your finances, and it is limiting where your family can go financially. You need to trust the Lord. people tonight, you've had things happen in your childhood that you did not tell anyone about. You must deal with that. It will hurt at first, but freedom will follow. Address it. That lifestyle that you're living that nobody knows about, those feelings that you're feeling, God wants to bring healing to you, but you must expose it. You must expose the enemy for who he is, a liar and a failure. And if you want victory, you must call out to Jesus for help. And as you call out to Jesus, you must get others in your life to help you too. I'm believing for some young men, some young men who need to live a life of purity and holiness to get off the internet and to shut down some websites and to stop, to stop sleeping with their girlfriends and to say, no, I'm going to live a life of worshiping in spirit and in truth. I am a man of integrity. I am picking up arms to fight the enemy on behalf of Jesus. God is dealing with some people right now. You see it. You see it right now. You need to confess that and ask for forgiveness. The Holy Spirit has highlighted areas in your life.
Somebody here, you're, you, you've been doubting the Lord, your faith, you're having a faith crisis, a faith crisis. And right now, in Jesus' name, the Holy Spirit is revealing himself to you. And no longer will you doubt. God's about to show up and blow your mind. Trust him again. Stop running again. There, there's people, you, you actually have a call to the ministry, but you're so afraid and you're hurt from a previous church experience. Let it go. You must enact forgiveness or you are limiting your potential and your destiny. Father, right now, every person who's responding tonight in need of freedom, God, would you meet them and free them? Would you do a healing work? Thank you, Lord, that lives are forever transformed and changed right now in this moment. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, let's worship together all we got before we go. Let's give God a praise. Come on, let's sing.